Hi, my name is Amy France. I'm the Senior Director of Alumni Engagement at Gordon College and an alumni of the class of 2001. Um, thanks for being here tonight. This is the sixth in our Alumni Talk series. Um, and we're really excited to have um, a wonderful panel of um, different folks who have been either currently in a law profession or have been in a law profession um, from our alumni community. We're really excited for you to hear from them, um, to hear about their journeys and to ask them different questions. Um, and so I'd love to invite um, my panelists um, to join me. Um, they can start their videos and unmute themselves. Great, thanks everybody. Glad to have you guys with us. Um, so I'd like to go around and introduce everybody. Um, and if you all just want to say a quick hello and um, glad to be here, and then we can go into deeper introductions in a few moments. Um, but first, I'd love to start with um, Chris Hollinger. Um, he is from the class of 91, and he is an attorney um, at Go Lightly, Mulligan, and Morgan. Thanks for being here, Chris. Thanks, Amy. Appreciate it. Uh, everybody hearing me okay? I switched to my headset while we were muted. Am I good to go? Good. Okay, awesome. Thanks. <laughs> Glad to have you with us, Chris. Um, and we have Doug McGray from the class of 1981. Um, Doug is now currently the president of Stone Crop Wealth Advisors um, and has a long history in the area of law prior to um, his work in the, in the wealth industry. Uh, good evening. It's good to, good to be here. Great. Thanks, Doug. Great to see you. And then we have, and Joel, if I, please correct me if I haven't pronounced your last name correctly, Joel Nolette. Am I done okay? Awesome. Um, Joel is from the class of 2011 and is currently a law clerk with the U.S. Court of Appeals. Glad to have you with us, Joel. So great to be with you tonight. Ah, what circuit? What circuit? Who? <laughs> uh, eight, eight circuit with Judge Grunder. Thanks. <laughs> and then, last but not least, we have Chelsea. And Chelsea, you're going to have to help me on your last name. Capes? Capes. Capes. Thank you very much. So Chelsea Capes um, from the class of 2015. She is currently a law clerk with the U.S. District Court in Washington, D.C. Um, and um, this is a new appointment from, for her from in, within the last three months. Is that correct, Chelsea? Yeah, that's right. Uh, my judge just started in September, so we're all brand new. Excellent, excellent. Well, we're really excited to hear from you and to learn from you as well. So glad to have you with us, Chelsea. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, of course. Well, um, again, so students, we're really excited to have you on with us tonight. We've got an awesome panel. Um, I have a number of questions that I look forward to working through with everybody here. Um, but students, you're well, more than welcome to use the Q&A function um, and to type in questions there. And panelists, just so you know, I'm going to keep my eye on that Q&A function, so no need to keep your eye on that. Um, and I'll certainly kind of feed those questions to you as we get them throughout the evening. Um, so let's just start with um, some more, uh, some deeper introductions. Um, Chris, would you mind starting us off to give us a little bit of kind of your background and how you got into law and what kind of law you practice at this point? Sure, happy to. So um, as, uh, as Amy mentioned, I was class of 91 at Gordon. Uh, do not let my advanced age fool you. I have not been a lawyer for 30 years. I did uh, 23 years in the Air Force as an aviator. I was not a JAG did not pursue law immediately. So it wasn't until I retired in 2014 uh, and decided that uh, my desire to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, needed to continue. And I saw the law as a way to do that uh, in, in defending the Constitution uh, through, the, through the court system. So I determined as I was uh, ending up my Air Force career to take the LSAT and uh, was blessed with the opportunity to go to Regent University School of Law, which is right here in Virginia Beach, about 10 minutes from my house. Uh, took that as a significant sign uh, from the Lord that that was an opportunity that was going to be open to me because I was not prepared to move my family or do anything like that. So uh, I started at Regent in 2014, basically in the last two weeks of my terminal leave from the Air Force. Uh, did my, my three years there at Regent, graduated in the class of 2017. And then I clerked for two years on the Virginia Court of Appeals. So I clerked for the chief judge of the Virginia Court of Appeals and then moved from there to uh, Troutman's, Troutman Sanders, which is now Troutman Pepper, um, a big law firm that has an office in Virginia Beach. I did a year of uh, con consumer financial services litigation, um, which was <clears throat> somewhat interesting 
uh, and great people to work with. I got the big law experience for a little bit, but it wasn't really my passion. Uh, what I really am passionate about is uh, appellate law, appellate practice, and uh, constitutional law. So I was presented with an opportunity about, uh, well, a couple months ago now, it's what is it, November? Yeah, but beginning of at the, the middle of August, my current boss uh, approached me and offered me a job uh, to come work for her as an associate in her small local firm here in Virginia, uh, in Virginia Beach, fo focusing primarily on, uh, her practice focuses primarily on commercial insurance defense. Uh, she also does a little bit of uh, professional liability defense, uh, 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 professional responsibility stuff uh, with, within the law, like bar complaint defense and things like that. And then she specifically invited me to start building an appellate practice uh, in their firm. So uh, I spend uh, probably about 30% of my time focusing on appeals. I've got an appeal. Uh, well, I've got a petition pending before the Virginia Supreme Court right now, uh, and I'm I'm defending, I'm, I'm resisting a petition in the Virginia Supreme Court as well. So those are my first two appeals that I've got going right now, as well, along with doing a bunch of, uh, you know, civil litigation uh, in Virginia courts. And I, I really enjoy that a lot more because I'm working with people that I know and in a, in a court system and dealing with law that I'm a lot more familiar with uh, than what I was doing at Troutman. So uh, yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. Doug, would you give us a little bit of your background? Uh, sure. I, uh, I'm, I'm the, the old one on the panel. I graduated in 81 uh, and immediately uh, after grad, and I was a political science major uh, and immediately went on the mission field for a couple of years uh, over in um, uh, Micronesia. <clears throat> and at that point was kind of toying back and forth with uh, seminary or law school and ultimately decided law school uh, to the chagrin of many of my uh, uh, people I was hanging out with on the mission field. But uh, but enjoyed the mission work, then came back and went to Suffolk uh, Law School, uh, University Law School, and uh, did way better in law school than I did in college. Uh, I, I finally decided to be a student. <clears throat> and uh, from there, ended up getting um, uh, recruited by a law firm down in Wilmington, Delaware, uh, and uh, practiced law at a, a mid-sized firm there for a while, for about seven years. Uh, in private practice and then uh, made my way up to partner, didn't like the deal um, after it was presented to me. So I ended up starting my own firm for about five years and uh, ended up d going from doing mostly civil litigation uh, a variety, in a variety of uh, uh, capacities, corporate in Delaware, everyone does some corporate work, uh, as well as uh, some of the same things that um, Chris was talking about, some, some uh, insurance defense and some other things like that. And then ultimately um, getting a little um, uh, tired of the gamesmanship of litigation. I just wasn't in love with it. Um, uh, decided to move our, over into transactional law. And that ultimately got me into estate planning and uh, corporate law. And unbeknownst to me, that made me attractive to um, the wealth management industry. Having an estate planning background, I started getting recruiting calls. Um, and ultimately I got the opportunity to, uh, to to buy part of a, a financial planning practice, uh, fell in love with what they did, went out and got my certified financial planner designation and have never looked back. So I left the practice of law and uh, have been doing wealth management ever since. Awesome, thanks Doug, appreciate your perspective tonight. Joel, would you mind sharing more about your background and how you got to where you are? Of course, um, so I was Gordon class of 2011 uh, I was a biblical studies major in my time at Gordon um, in a very, probably very fitting for a, a Gordon student. Uh, my journey into law uh, could probably be summed up as a, a, a crisis of vocation uh, where I thought I knew what I wanted to do and was dead set on that path. And um, by the time I graduated, uh, I had realized that, um, uh, that that was not God's plan for me. So I moved back to Western Mass. Uh, and um, uh, did some did some work there. I was actually a letter carrier with the Postal Service for a few years, uh, from uh, tw after graduation to uh, 2014. Uh, and while I was delivering mail, I uh, um, I don't want to say on a lark, but um, uh, the spirit moved, and I got the uh, the idea to take the LSAT and uh, see uh, see how I how I might do, uh, and decide whether or not law school would be in the cards for me if that could be a good good second vocation. And uh, uh, sure enough, did. Did well enough, and uh, and uh, got into Georgetown. So I went to Georgetown Law uh, in DC, uh, 2014. Graduated class of 2017. Uh, I after graduation, I headed back to Boston, uh, and uh, I worked in private practice for two years uh, at a firm in the city. 
uh, I did um, sort of jack of all trades, general commercial litigation, although uh, the insurance group at the firm uh, sort of um, appropriated uh, me, if you will, and I ended up doing a lot of insurance coverage work uh, by the time I ended there. Uh, in 2019, I left the firm in Boston and I started where I'm currently at, which is clerking on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit here in St. Louis. Thanks so much, Joel. Chelsea, would you mind sharing a little bit about your background and how you got to where you are? Sure. So I got to Gordon knowing that I wanted to go to law school, actually, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I graduated from Gordon in 2015. And when I was there, I studied English and political science and did the pre-law minor. Um, I worked for a year after that in a small law office in Linfield, Massachusetts, that a lot of Gordon alums work at. They do estate planning and elder law, some of that transactional work that um, Doug mentioned. And um, then I did a year with the Episcopal Service Corps in Memphis, Tennessee through a Gordon connection. And I worked there in the public defender's office. That's, I didn't know what this was when I was in college, but um, for people who are charged with a crime and can't afford a lawyer, they're constitutionally guaranteed one. So um, that public defenders are the people that represent them. I also worked in a nonprofit that did criminal justice reform while I was in Memphis. And those two experiences were really formative for me in terms of directing what kind of work I was gonna do as a lawyer. Um, I went to law school at Duke University in North Carolina and I just graduated in May uh, with virtual classes for the last few months. Um, I was planning to go back to come back up to New England to be a New Hampshire public defender as that's what I did for my second summer between uh, years of law school and I loved it. Um, but things got a little crazy as we all know and I ended up clerking here in Washington DC for a new magistrate judge. Um, so it's kind of an assistant judge to the district court judges in the federal court here. And um, I've been doing that since September, took the bar exam in October, uh, and I'll be starting as a public defender next year. You didn't take the bar until October? It was postponed twice and moved online for the first time ever. Did you take the UBE or did you take the, the New Hampshire bar? The New Hampshire bar is UBE, um, oh, okay. the uniform bar exam. So there's a most states now are on that for those of you who are unfamiliar with that whole system yet. Um, there's more transferability between states. With the pandemic, every state that administered an online October bar exam then has reciprocity. So it's a little different than normal, but. Gotcha, sorry, little inside baseball there. But Virginia bar results just came out, you know, a couple of weeks ago. So that's always, that's a big time, right? You know, if there's, you know, it's a, that's a big deal for everybody, obviously. So good luck, Chelsea. I'm sure if you've got a clerkship, I'm sure you have nothing to worry about on the bar. Thank you. <laughs> no, that's great. I love this. I love the, the questions and the inside scoop. It's great for, for everyone to, to learn and to hear the lingo and, and what, what folks need to know. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about kind of what you did during your time at college and you were, a few of you are already alluding to this wasn't the plan or this was definitely the plan. Um, but I'd love for each of you to kind of touch on something that occurred maybe during your time at Gordon, whether you knew that law was a path you were going on or not, but what was something that happened during your time that really um, still propelled you into your careers? Um, or something you still carried now into your career in law. Um, Joel, not to put you on the spot, but would you mind going first? <laughs> uh, sure. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, I was a biblical studies major. Uh, and uh, it might seem like an idiosyncratic connection, but uh, to me, it, it made a lot of sense uh, after I graduated. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I mentioned that uh, I, I had to revert to plan B after graduation because uh, plan A uh, was not in the cards. Uh, I thought I was going to head on to divinity school or seminary. 
uh, and maybe go on to be a pastor teacher or a, a religious studies professor in some way, shape or form. Um, but um, uh, so a, as I started on plan B and uh, began to consider uh, what I could do, um, it was in fact the Jewish studies concentration that I did uh, at Gordon uh, and uh, taking all those classes with Dr. Wilson uh, and um, you know, seeing how really legal thinking and legal analysis is done uh, in the in like the Mishnah and the Talmud, how how these rabbis would take this rule uh, and it you know would come from a, a passage in scripture, and there would be this whole complex structure of sub rules that were rooted in that rule, and there were disagreements between the rabbis about uh, which rule was was right or not, and and it was it was that process that sort of um, got me thinking. You know what? This is so fascinating, and um, uh, it's so so critical to society. Uh, so maybe uh, maybe I should think about and pursue a career in law. And uh, and here I am today. I love it. Anything for a good Marv Wilson story, anyways. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you, Doug. What about for you? Well, I, I had no idea what I wanted to do when I got to college. Um, all I was the first one in my extended family to go to college, so. Um, all I knew, my father was a plumber, his father was a plumber, you know, so all I knew is I didn't want to be a plumber. Um, so I wanted to do something with a white collar. That was really my ambition. Um, and so political science sounded good. Uh, the one thing I do remember from early on uh, in my studies was uh, uh, them talking about, um, at the time they were using the phrase sphere sovereignty, how God is sovereign over everything and over every different uh, uh, vocation. And that kind of stuck with me because ultimately, and, and then throughout my Gordon experience, I took business law, I did the American studies program and just again, show you people how old I am. I worked on the John Anderson for president campaign. I didn't like Reagan or Carter. Um, and uh, so that kind of got me into the political realm and the, and the legal realm and, uh, but decided to go on the mission field uh, instead, at least for, for a time. And it was really out there that I really wrestled with God as to, to what the next step was. And, you know, I have a longer testimony. I don't even know, quite, I don't think I was even a Christian at that point. I, I wrestled a lot even out there and ultimately gave my life to the Lord out there. Um, that's that's a, another story for another day. But, but ultimately, when I was out there, I was really, you know, asking God which direction to go. And when you're hanging out with missionaries, uh, they don't think, you know, people who are really serious about their faith should go into law school. They think you should go to seminary or stay on the mission field. It just doesn't make sense. So I was kind of up against that, but it, I just really felt a strong pull that my vocation really wasn't, um, uh, that I really, it wasn't it going in the direction of becoming a pastor uh, or a long-term missionary. It just didn't seem to be the right profession for me. I couldn't see myself preaching or, or managing a church or all those different things that pastors need to do. There are some parts about it that were, uh, attractive, but uh, it just didn't seem to be my vocation. And so ultimately, um, knowing what I like to do, knowing what I, that, that I was good at, um, I decided to go off into law school uh, during that stretch. So I came back and uh, took the law school exam for the second time, because the first time I took it was before I went to went overseas. And, um, you know, I felt at that time, God was telling me not to go to law school, because I um, more than uh, less than halfway through the exam, they had to come in with a, an ambulance and take me out because I got acute appendicitis during the LSAT. Um, so that one didn't count. I had to take it when I got back. And so but I took it and everything went well the second time, although I had some PTSD. But uh, um, so that, that's that's my story. That's that's a good one. I do like that you did not take it as a sign that you were not supposed to go to law school. I did question it you got appendicitis in the middle of the exam. I mean, most, a lot of people would say, okay, got it, I'm not doing that. <laughs> That's great. Chris, can you beat Doug's story? That's the real question. Um, absolutely not. Uh, the only thing I would say in terms of my time at Gordon is that, uh, you know, I, I just, I love thinking deep thoughts, discussing deep complicated issues and the philosophy behind them. Uh, I was a business major because that, that when I was in college, I thought I was going to do four years in the Air Force to, to pay back the government for my college scholarship and then go out into the business world. 
um, and you know was was sold out on the idea of integrating my faith in my profession as a as a businessman. And that changed when I was a senior and decided to make the Air Force a career. But uh, at the end of the day, the thing about Gordon, I think, that helped me get ready for law school, even though I didn't necessarily see it on the horizon, was just the uh, the environment that encouraged me to think deep thoughts, to wrestle with tough questions, the late night conversations with people about everything from theology to philosophy to politics, uh, you know, in the late 80s or, and early 90s, um, to, you know, the time of the first Gulf War and all the stuff that was going on there. I just I love debating policy. Uh, I didn't get to do American studies, but I would have loved to. That that was the kind of stuff that that impacted me and helped me develop my my ability to grapple with tough questions and think hard about complicated questions because that's what a lot of that's a lot of what lawyers do is is think hard about tough questions and uh, and come up with some creative solutions. Great, thanks, Chris. Chelsea, love to hear from you about you know something that occurred at Borden uh, during your time that you feel like helped you. I think because of when you graduated to, you may have other things that you either would have recommended that you wish that you had done or, or taken advantage of or something like that. So feel free to add any, anything into that too. Yeah, I think one of the best experiences I had that prepared me for law school was studying abroad in Oxford. Um, so I was able to take English classes there. I did Victorian literature. I was reading 800 page books every week. No better preparation for law school than that. Um, it was, so that was a good experience, just helping me be more efficient with reading um, and writing. And then I think in terms of my, um, what I felt like my calling was in the law, the thing at Gordon that contributed the most was being in the Jerusalem and Athens forum. Uh, we did our debate my year on the death penalty. And so at the, we spent months researching that and it started opening my eyes to kind of the continuing racial disparities in the criminal justice system and wealth disparities. And that is definitely the direction of um, issue areas that I'm going into being a public defender. So starting to think about those things with you know, smart friends who cared about um, equality and, and dignity. And um, yeah, that was a, a great experience for me at Gordon. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, we've got a couple of questions in already, and I'd love for um, one that's already in here um, from one of our students. Um, he's interested in applying for law school next fall and wanted to know what type of internship would look best on an application. And does it have to be in a law office or could I intern at, let's say, a think tank? Um, maybe panelists, if you wouldn't mind just kind of raising your hand, if you'd like to be the one to kind of attempt an answer at this question, I'm happy for you to take that. Man. Yeah, go ahead, Doug. Yeah, I, I don't think it has to be a, a, a law thing for, for uh, I, I do think that uh, what they want to see is you can think critically, you can write, you can communicate, you can work with other, uh, you know, in, in, an, in that kind of environment. Um, so yeah, I, obviously, it'd be, if it's a law position, it could be advantageous, but it doesn't have to be. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that. I, I didn't want to be the spring button, always be the first guy to talk, but uh, I know from everything that I heard from both from my school and from my friends in the other Virginia schools, uh, the number one thing that gets you into law school is your LSAT score. Absolutely number one, far ahead of anything else. So, you know, you can have the best internship in the world. If you tank the LSAT, you're not getting into a good law school. And if you've got a great LSAT score, they're not going to care whether you interned at a law firm, a think tank, or McDonald's. That's really what it comes down to. Uh, you know, grades, obviously, undergrad grades are important, but yeah, the type of internship you do, infinitesimally small on the, on the scale. Joel, Chelsea, would you guys agree with that, with your experiences having more recently applied? Yeah, yeah, I would. Uh, the only piece of advice I would give is, you know, bloom where you're planted. Um, pursue the opportunity that really interests you um, and just do your best at it. Uh, because uh, as the other said, uh, ultimately, I don't don't think the law school, at least, you know, in the admissions process, they're not going to care too much 
about your prior legal experience coming into law school. Uh, so. I would just add that I think interning is more about what you get out of it in terms of deciding whether you want to be a lawyer, what kind of legal work you might be interested in. I worked um, my last summer at Gordon at the law office that I then worked for for a year after I graduated. Um, and I felt like it was helpful to just get a sense of what legal documents look like and what um, the different kinds of things that lawyers do. And it helped me figure out before law school that I didn't want to do transactional work and I wasn't interested in estate planning and elder law. So then I knew that it, to pursue other things to figure out where I wanted to go. There's a lot of options and going to law school doesn't necessarily help you narrow down what you should do when you get there. Great, helpful advice, thank you. Um, let's see, a question actually specifically for Chelsea because you were already thinking law in college, <laughs> so that's why it's for you. Um, what kind of internships did you have during college and what classes did you take that helped continue your cur curiosity for law? Yeah, I think I've already answered that in a couple different parts. Um, one other class, I'm not sure if it's still available, was a poverty law class that was taught by an adjunct professor, which I thought was really cool. So just keeping an eye out for opportunities like that. I worked in admissions prior to that and, and then in event planning for the college. And it was really just my last summer and last year that I did something legal. Um, and I felt like those are just good experiences as a person. So nothing else to add besides the things I've already mentioned. Great, thanks. Um, is it ever too early to start preparing for the LSAT? <laughs> Doug, Doug gets to answer this because he, he already has the answer. Um, again, because I had the advantage of um, uh, ending up in a hospital for my first one, I had plenty of time when I was overseas. So I took materials over there and practiced for a couple of years, which was good because, you know, as I alluded to before at Gordon, I was trying to discover, you know, I, I was an okay student, but not a great student. Um, and so my grades weren't going to get me into a good law school. So I knew I had to do great on the LSATs. Um, and so working on a little bit at a time and figuring out what, you know, so no, I don't, it's hard to over prepare for that uh, unless you're really, really good at, at those kind of exams. Uh, uh, so I, I would say that as Chris said, it's really important uh, to, to where you're going to get and you want to give yourself as many opportunities as possible. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, echo that again. The point being, taking it more than once is not a problem. Like I, I, most of my friends took the LSAT more than once. Uh, I, I didn't for two reasons. One, because I started the process kind of late uh, in you know, just the application process in general. Uh, and number two, I was very much, uh, my whole process was very much just kind of like laying out a fleece. Okay, God, like, let's see if this is gonna happen you know, I'm going to do well enough on the LSAT in the time that I've got to do it, and I'm going to get accepted at Regent because I'm not going anywhere else. Uh, if those things didn't work out, I had plenty of other options. So I took the LSAT. I, I prepped for it. I did. I spent a lot of time preparing for it, um, but I, you know, I only took it the one time. I had lots of friends that took it multiple times. So if you start earlier, you've got the opportunity to take it, see how you do, study for a while longer, take it again. Like you don't have to get appendicitis in the test to justify taking it a second time. You just gotta be willing to shell out the money and, and give yourself the time to do it. Cause they only, I, I don't even remember now, what do they offer it maybe three or four times a year? Do you guys remember Chelsea the, or Joel? You guys went through that process a little bit more recently than me, but it, anyway, you know, a couple times a year they offer it. So yeah, that's it. That's great. Thanks everybody. <clears throat> Let's see, here's another question we've got. Um, what about getting into law school with a GRE? I've heard that many schools are starting to accept that. Does the LSAT give you a better chance to get into law school than the GRE? Yeah, I'll, I can jump in here. Uh, it, that's a relatively recent trend. Um, I would say, one, don't bank on that. Don't just take the GRE. Um, because to my knowledge, 
really only Harvard, Yale, and a few other schools have started to treat it as uh, in parity with the LSAT, and uh, maybe more uh, uh, by now. But um, so you definitely want to take the LSAT. Um, you know, if you're planning on taking the GRE, I think that's that's fine. Uh, you can probably strengthen your case for admission to one of those top tier schools if you knock it out of the park. Great. Yeah, but who wants to go to Harvard anyway? <laughs> no, great questions. Thanks, everybody. Um, love to hear a little bit from everybody more about what does your day to day look like? Actually, Joel, would you mind starting us off? I'd love to know what does the day to day of your work actually look like? Sure. So, you know, in my current position as a law clerk, um, in a word, it's it's pretty monastic. Um, you know, we, we I work in chambers, so I go into the office. Uh, you know, we're we're in the federal building here in St. Louis. We're we're in our own little corner of the building. It's just the seven or eight of us who work uh, in chambers, and we go into our offices and. Uh, we, uh, at least the workflow in my chambers, um, without getting into the real uh, boring nitty gritty is, you know, appeals are filed. Uh, the clerk of the court then assigns uh, the cases to the various judges who are on the Eighth Circuit. So my judge gets, uh, gets assigned a bunch of cases. Uh, uh, when we get those assignments internally within chambers, there are four of us law clerks. Uh, and so we then divvy up the assignments uh, of the cases that have been assigned to our judge. We then do the research, we, we read the briefs, we, we dig into the law, we dig into the record and, and ascertain the facts. Uh, and um, we then sort of collaborate with the judge uh, and uh, essentially service his lawyer. We're, we're uh, uh, counseling him on what the law is, what the facts of the case are, and, and what, uh, what the decision ultimately should be. Uh, uh, then the case gets heard. Uh, the judges then confer about how the case should, uh, should be disposed. Uh, and um, uh, the, opin the opinion gets assigned to one of the judges on the panel. If my judge uh, gets the assignment to be the author, uh, I then work with my judge uh, on, on drafting the opinion and, you know, very, very similar type of work. Again, um, more or less his lawyer counseling him on, on what the law is and what the facts are of this case. Uh, so we can, we can decide it rightly, uh, do justice by the parties and, and get the law right. Thank you. Chelsea, what is How much of your bench brief becomes the opinion? Depends on the case. Uh, okay. <laughs> Chelsea, what about for you? Day to day, what does that look like? Is it a lot different than Joel? Is it similar? Pretty similar. We're at the district court level, so that's the trial courts for the federal um, judiciary. So we have more like detention hearings for people who've just been arrested and deciding whether they should be detained pre-trial or released pre-trial. Um, discovery disputes about what parties want to share with the other side, what they're obligated to share with the other side and things like that. Um, I'll share a little bit just for some variety about what I did as a public defender intern last summer. Um, I had the opportunity having two years of law school experience to be able to appear in court uh, on behalf of clients with supervision, which is pretty surprising um, that they let you do that before you have a law license or graduate law school. But I had my own caseload. I had uh, a case that I was able to meet with the client for, talk about what happened, um, go out and do some own, my, of my own investigation about the scene of, you know, of where the, the alleged crime happened. And then I had a bench trial in front of a judge and I cross-examined a police officer, cross-examined a witness, um, made arguments at the beginning and the end and actually won. So that was really cool. I did, I was able to get that outcome for, for someone who I really feel like deserved it and didn't, didn't break the law. So, um, and in addition to that, just a lot of researching about evidence and whether evidence is admissible or not, that kind of thing. Um, and that's what I'm looking forward to going back to. Great. Great. Chris, what about for you? What does day-to-day -day look like for you in your work? Yeah, sure. So now that I'm no longer a clerk, which when, when, and when I was a clerk, my day sounded exactly like Joel's. I was at the state level, but I was doing the exact same thing, clerking for an appellate judge. Um, so now, 
uh, now that I'm in private practice, uh, I'm, I'm trying really hard to spend as much time as I can doing similar kinds of things only on behalf of a client. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to go into appellate law uh, so that I could focus on taking the facts as they were established in the trial court and then analyzing the law and coming up with the legal arguments to explain why either there was an error of law in the trial court or not, depending on which side I'm on. Um, in addition to that, because I, I'm not got enough work to, to you know, earn my keep totally doing that alone, I assist the partners in my firm with uh, the other general civil litigation stuff that we do. Uh, so that can be everything from working on discovery requests and answering discovery requests uh, to drafting motions and uh, going into court and, and arguing cases too. So I've done everything in the last couple of weeks from uh, arguing a dispositive motion in state court, uh, in, the, in state circuit court, to writing a dispositive motion brief for a federal district court case. Uh, I'm actually trying a case in Virginia General District Court, in, in uh, Virginia Beach General District Court on Thursday. So I'm, I'm hitting kind of all the levels in the Virginia court system and a little bit of federal district court. Uh, I haven't had a federal appeal yet. Um, I'm still kind of, you know, I've only been doing this now for, for a couple of months. Um, although I, I wrote some federal appellate briefs when I was working at Troutman, uh, just a couple of those. So it's, it's, a, it's a big mix. That's one of the things that I like about it. It's not the same thing every day. Uh, but I, I much prefer doing things like arguing dispositive motions. So a, a motion to dismiss or in the, in the state court, a demur, uh, something like that, or, uh, uh, you know, um, because those are all just arguing the law and I'm a big, I'm a lot more comfortable arguing the law to a judge or having a discussion about the law in front of a judge or a panel of judges, as opposed to trying to convince jurors of what the facts are of the case. So where Chelsea was in the trial court as a public defender uh, and convincing a judge of what the facts were in their case and getting a decision. Uh, I'm, I, that's not my thing. I don't enjoy that as much. I do it. I'll be doing it on Thursday. Um, but as much as possible, I try to stick to the, uh, you know, arguing the law kind of stuff. Um, it's funny to hear Chelsea's story. Uh, I, my 2L summer, I was actually an intern with a 3L practice certificate uh, at the federal prosecutor's office, the U.S. attorney's office here in Norfolk, and got to do the same kind of thing that she did on the prosecutor's side, um, and also enjoy that. That was a great experience to kind of get a sense of what it's like to be doing trial work uh, after having interned on the Virginia Supreme Court. So I kind of saw a wide scope of things, realized that if I had to do a lot of trial work, being a prosecutor was something I could probably do and, and not to totally hate it, um, but I still I still don't like doing the trial stuff as much as I like doing the, the other stuff that's more just about arguing the law. Um, yeah, my, the first time I got into federal court, it was a sentencing hearing, and I was up against the head of the federal public defender's office. He was arguing on the other side. So here I was, a, a law student appearing for the first time with supervision, you know, having never been in court before ever in my life appearing to argue this sentencing, basically just making a recommendation to the judge about why we thought the sentence should be X, Y, or Z. That's all it was. Uh, and on the other side was, it was supposed to be the battle of the interns. He had an intern as well that was supposed to come in, but she didn't show up. So it was me against the head of the de public defender's office. And I, I had to turn and chuckle with him when it was all over. I said, I hope you're happy. You will never argue against a less experienced opponent than you have today. <laughs> you got a good chuckle out of that. It was entertaining. We kind of each got part of what we wanted. <laughs> Perfect. That's perfect. Doug, um, anything that you would want to add from your time when you were kind of practicing law, anything that you would kind of add to these experiences of what day-to-day -day work looked like for you at that time? Yeah, it was more, I mean, I've done a little bit of what uh, yeah, a lot of the other than the law clerk stuff. I mean, I, I was involved in a very similar program to Chelsea with a program run by Harvard. I uh, worked in Dorchester um, and, and did some le legal defense, uh, criminal defense there. But, um, you know, my, my early, you know, I kind of had three different careers early on. I was doing a lot of litigation. I was very fortunate because in my first year, we did a lot of civil litigation. And um, one of the partners came to me and said, uh, this case is a loser. It's all ready for trial. And the, the other side won't settle. So you're, ta you're taking it to trial. Um, so they figured they're going to lose anyway. Um, so I, I, I did my very first jury trial after about six months. And by some miracle uh got a defense verdict for uh someone who had rear-ended somebody else uh and um so that got me fortunately that got me some, some really um some good trial work early on and i loved being in front of a jury 
<laughs> what I didn't love was all the gamesmanship getting to the trial, all the discovery nonsense and, and you know, you know the, the motion practice and all of that. I, I love drafting the motions, but what I didn't like was all the political nonsense with lawyers. I, and at one point, I, I worked with a consultant who basically said, most lawyers love this stuff. You don't. So over time, they're going to get better at it than you are. So you might want to think about, you know, migrating. So that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I went into transactional work. That was much more rewarding for me because then there's a lot more client interfacing. How do we solve this client's problem? And so I had a lot more time spent literally sitting across the, um, the desk with actual clients, solving real client problems, drafting documents for lawyers, incorporating uh, entities. Uh, that was a, a, a lot of fun. And and now that um, you know, now that I'm out of the practice, the legal part of it still exists because one of the things they teach in law school really is how to write pr pretty voluminous stuff pretty fast, um, and uh, that's really become an advantage. I, I do, I'm able to do a weekly newsletter, and I'm able to um, uh, do RFPs um, uh, in a manner that most of my competition can't do. So uh, it's uh, so that's that's been a real benefit. It's interesting. I feel like a, a theme that I'm hearing from all of you um, is just the experience. I mean, the experience helps you define what you're most interested in. And it's sort of like until you get in that, you could hear from as many people as you like about what it could be like, but it really is often learning yourself, like your personal preferences. I don't know if could someone else maybe articulate that a little bit better than I, I'm able to. <laughs> Thanks, Joel. Joel. Yep. <laughs> Nailed it on the head. Uh, it's trial. It, it really is. So much of this is trial and error. It's taking classes at law school that you think you're interested in, and then you realize, wow, this is you know drier, drier than the Sahara. Uh, <laughs> or, or you, you know, you do things in private practice that you never thought you'd be interested. Insurance law is a great example for me. I didn't take a class in law school that you know that was focused on in insurance. Um, didn't think that I would enjoy it uh, at all. I got a few projects in private practice and um, it's it's a topic of interest now for me. I, uh, I, I like thinking about it, writing about it and, uh, and just working in that space. So you just gotta try things and figure it out. Well, that's great. That's great. We, we actually had a follow-up question here too from one of our earlier question askers. Um, so do you choose like a concentration when you're in law school? Is it similar to like a major selection in your undergrad? Um, so if if this person was interested in constitutional law, is that is there a specific concentration for that? I'll answer quickly and then let the others talk about it too, because I, I think the first part of the, the answer to that is it depends on the school. So I, I suspect from things that I learned from friends who went to much bigger law schools than Regent, uh, I think there are some schools that have concentrations like that. It's not required, um, but there are certainly places that do that. Smaller schools, such like Regent, didn't really have any particular concentrations, but there's, it's typically something that you can do, even if it's not like a declared major, you know, you're, of the hours that you take, certain amounts of it are going to be core black letter law stuff, and certain amounts of it are going to be electives to do what you want, and you can tailor it and focus it in those areas. Um, so that's kind of the general way. Um, and I had to ask, I'm sorry, I had to ask Cam if he was related or she, I'm sorry, I, it's hard to tell if that's Cam, Cameron, he or she, I don't know, I apologize, but um, <laughs> Bob Grinnell recruited me to come to Gordon as a freshman. So, the, and I know when I was dropping my daughter off a couple of years ago, I saw him there. Uh, so Cam, if you're a junior, that's why I guess I saw Bob because you're in my daughter, you're my daughter's classmate. Um, but just dang it, <laughs> it's really cool. Isn't really it? Cool. it? It is I'm that, that I'm, Cam. I'm a Bob Grinnell fan, even though I haven't seen him in decades. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I, anyway. I'll speak on Cam's behalf because I have had a chance to at least virtually meet him. Um, so it, it is that that Cam of the of the Grinnell clan. So cool. Good to have tuning in anyway. and asking great questions. Hey, study, study con law. It's hard to make a living early on as a constitutional lawyer. Uh, you know, working for public interest law firms and that kind of thing. Uh, but there's lots of places that do it and. Uh, yeah, there you go. So, I, I actually was a classmate of Bob's. We graduated the same year, so I have stories. You can email Doug McGray at, <laughs> or you can find him on, on LinkedIn. 
Um, Joel or, or Chelsea, any more that you'd want to contribute in terms of kind of your experiences at your uh, schools in particular of kind of concentrations or how you kind of find uh, your niche area while you're there? Yeah, as a general rule, I think it's right that you don't pick any concentration or major. Uh, I graduated with a certificate in public interest in public service law. So I think that's something newer that some schools are doing. And within programs like that, they are starting to develop kind of a timed suggested set of classes that you should take for different interest areas. They hadn't had that yet at Duke when I was there. Um, but you do have to kind of find the people in the year or two ahead of you that are interested in some of the areas of law that you're interested in, see what classes they're taking or internships they're recommending. I, I found that to be the most helpful way to get connected and figure out a plan. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Chelsea. To put it in, in Gordon terms, uh, law school is like the Pike, Pike program or Pike scholarship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's your first year is set for you. And thereafter, it is almost completely choose your own adventure. Um, so uh, and then everything. Yeah, everything that Chelsea said is, is exactly right. It's uh, which is probably wonderful and terrifying all at the same time. <laughs> Yes, it can be, which is why it's important to seek out those mentors and get good advice. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, an important question that I'd love for all of you to contribute to. I'd love to hear more about how you carry out your faith in the workplace. Um, what does that look like um, to really kind of hold that tension in some of the, the work that you have to do. I'm sure there's there's some, some great challenges um, in terms of both colleagues and cases. And I'm sure there's a plethora of ways that it could be challenging to continue to kind of hold on to your faith in, in those areas. Would you guys mind speaking a bit about that? I wanna go last, because if I start, I'm never gonna stop. <laughs> Joel, would you mind? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Be happy to. You. Um, you know, I, I think there are some uh, general principles that are true of all workplaces and in all work contexts uh, in which my faith comes to bear on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, collegiality, civility, um, you know, particularly in the litigation context, uh, th these things are critical. Uh, it can be really easy when you are representing a client and uh, doing your, your best to zealously advocate for their interests uh, to uh, become nasty. Uh, and, and so just bearing in mind that even when I'm writing up a demand letter or something like that, um, I still need to make sure that I am embodying a Christian ethic uh, and, uh, and showing Christ uh, even, even in that context. Um, I think more particularly, it very much depends on the role that you play um, in, in how, how, your, how your Christian witness uh, can, can come to bear on your practice. You know, so for instance, um, in private practice, my role was to represent a, a client uh, and uh, to, to serve God and to serve my neighbor, I need to represent that client's interest. Uh, in my current role as a law clerk, uh, we're focused on getting the law right uh, and, uh, and to do my best uh, diligently and faithfully every day. Uh, I need to, I'm not representing anybody's interests except my judges uh, and, and the interest is in getting the law right. Uh, so, um, you know, there, and there are issues that come before us that, um, uh, you know, can implicate matters of conscience, uh, you know, particularly uh, Chelsea mentioned earlier about the death penalty. Uh, and that's a particular sub area where uh, being a Christian and working in, in that sort of arena uh, can possibly be challenging depending on, on uh, your Christian convictions and your views on, on that issue. So uh, it's all very context specific, but uh, the general principles uh, are, are true throughout, uh, you know, love God, love your neighbors yourself. Thanks, Joel. I wanna jump in and echo what Joel said about thinking about what your role is in the legal system. And I think, maybe in more, more in this profession than in others, the intrinsic value of there being different roles is, is key. I think in the criminal system, 
each person like plays the good guy and the bad guy at different times. So a prosecutor could be fighting really hard to get justice for a family who's lost a loved one. And sometimes they're trying to convict the wrong person. And a defense attorney is, you know, fighting really hard to protect someone who's innocent sometimes and sometimes someone who's definitely guilty. But, um, and you know, sometimes the judge makes the wrong decision. Sometimes the judge's hands are tied about what justice really requires by what the law is and they can't do what they feel like is the right thing. Uh, but each piece of that has its intrinsic value of if everybody plays their role, then most of the time the right, the moral moral good outcome uh, is achieved. And that's been something definitely for me to wrestle with as wanting to be a, a public defender. But I think in that role specifically, I see when I learned about what public defenders did, I really saw it as come al coming alongside the most marginalized in society. Um, the people I think that Jesus commands most often to love and to serve the impoverished and the accused. Um, so finding that role for as a lawyer was really felt like this is exactly what my calling as a Christian is. So. Thanks, Chelsea. I'll, I'll chime in a couple things. First of all, I, I think uh, there's an occupational hazard for, for all of us who go into the law profession. And it's not just the law profession. I think it's professions in general, but for lawyers particularly, and that is um, we're always hanging out with other lawyers and we start speaking legalese and eventually um, uh, ego and, and arrogance can jump in because we, we have a, you know, the legal profession has a bad reputation uh, to some degree it's earned. And so we have to constantly fight that and, uh, and, and maintain our humility uh, in, in everything we do. I found that to be one of the biggest things. And I know when I got out of the legal business and when I jumped back into it, um, going to seminars or, or because of some legal things I'm still involved with, um, I get that, you know, that, that sensation of, of um, you know, that, that I'm around people who have, have that as an issue. So I think that's one of the, the things that, that we can be salt and light to. Um, and the other thing uh, that you can sometimes run into are, are ethics and billing. Um, you know, in the, the first firm where I was, I ended up, um, you know, we we had a discussion and I ended up leaving that firm because, you know, the, I couldn't, I couldn't um, reconcile what they wanted me to do um, with, uh, with my faith. And so uh, ultimately, um, uh, you know, I left that firm and went to another one. Uh, but in general, on the positive side, um, you know, our, 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 the skills you learn as a lawyer uh, are so valuable to the kingdom. Uh, and so we're stewarded with something that's very valuable uh, whether it's, um, you know, representing the disenfranchised or whether it's just upholding the rule of law, which is so critical. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, you know, God moves us around and, and my, my career path has been a little circuitous. Um, but, um, you know, I see now more than ever that uh, God was preparing me for something that was a little bit different. I still use my estate planning and my legal um, hat all the time. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, it, and it's something that, um, you know, as, as Joel said, serving, um, serving our neighbor. Uh, and if we're always looking at it, that, that our, our business, what we, our legal business that we've been handed um, is a stewardship. Um, and, and whatever business we have, the business I have now, I see as a stewardship and a way to serve, uh, to serve people. So um, that's something that, that God puts on our hearts. Um, and I think every day we need to, to, to realize that and, and um, make sure that that's what our focus is. Great. Thanks, John. Chris, what about for you? Hey, all right, thanks. Yeah, I, uh, so I will say that the the legal profession has a bad reputation, and I think, like Doug was saying, part of the reason for that is that so many people think of lawyers as just out to win at all costs. I think that's probably one of the pressures that uh, people face in litigation that can be the thing that's hard to square with your Christian convictions, um, whereas as a Christian, as a believer, I try to be more loyal to the, the broader concepts of justice. Um, and I think we as believers have a better foundation of what justice is because we, we, we uh, submit ourselves to a higher authority, the authority of, of, of God's word. And so it's easier 
in my mind, I, I think there's a law review article floating around here and some of these ideas I've been thinking about for a long time, but it's this, it's this idea that if I'm, you know, I'm already willing to submit myself to the authority of God's written revealed word, it makes it easier for me to understand that the law is supreme, that it's the law that matters and I obey the law and I don't necessarily, I, I advocate for my client to the best I can within the law, but I will draw the line at trying to distort the law, warp the law, just for the sake of getting a good outcome for my client. I've got to advocate as best I can, um, but I'm still going to stay within the rules, uh, I'm, and, and that's still important to me. Um, I will, I'm going to recruit just a bit for my law school, and I'm not going to feel too guilty about it because two of my three colleagues there go to schools that really don't need to recruit much. Um, but <laughs> Regent, one of the reasons that I was excited about having Regent so close to me was because it's a Christian law school. Um, and Regent's philosophy about developing lawyers is locked on on step with Gordon's idea of, you know, be salt and light in the legal community, be a Christian lawyer, professional identity and developing a professional identity is a huge part of growing in Regent at the law or at Regent in the law. The, the guy that heads our professional development uh, and professional identity program at, at Regent is a Harvard law grad, but he's also a Gordon Conwell uh, and Div. So he, he, Went to Harvard Law, worked in Boston for a while, then went to seminary. So he did both, Doug. It's, you don't have to choose either or. You can do both. Um, and now he teaches at Regent and teaches professional identity and that kind of thing. So um, if you're interested in pursuing law in the same kind of framework and from the same type of professional development framework that you get at Gordon in a place that has the same kind of worldview, Regent is the place for you and you need to get in touch with me and I'll help you get hooked up with the recruiters. Um, that's my pitch anyway. But yeah, uh, it you, did, know, you did great. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. I'm really excited to have, to have gone there. Um, and that and that's it. You know, it's, it's all about growing to be salt and light in the community, living out the, you know, the, all the civility stuff that everybody said. Totally agree. It's all makes perfect sense. I'll tell you what, I'll also affirm Chelsea in her role um, as a public defender. Uh, that was something that really, you know, opened my eyes. I had always been more of a, you know, prosecutor favorable law and order kind of guy. And I had a hard time understanding what it would, what it meant to defend someone that I know is guilty and all that kind of stuff. And what I learned through my time in school was the importance of the process, the importance of everybody being entitled to a rigorous defense. Uh, the fact that the, the basic concept of justice in our nation is that the prosecution has to prove beyond a half shadow of a doubt or beyond a reasonable doubt uh, that you did what you did. And everybody's entitled to a defense like that. And the public defender's job um, is, is incredibly important in that system because, yeah, there's a lot of people that can't afford good lawyers. And it's totally unjust for someone to end up in prison just because they couldn't afford a lawyer. Uh, so, you know, I, I have issues with the constitutional side of it. I, you know, the Constitution doesn't say anything about this. But I think as a matter of policy, it's absolutely appropriate. Like, I, I absolutely support the, you know, the public defender role. And I'm on the court appointed list to, to defend appeals, you know, to do criminal appeals on, on behalf of people who had public defenders at the, at the trial level. So uh, I certainly support trying to do that to just give somebody the best defense that they can get. Yeah, great. Thanks, Chris. Well, folks, I see that we're at time now. Um, I want to just thank our panelists, all of you so much. I feel like we could have gone on for another five rounds of questions here. Um, so I really appreciate all of the time that you've given to us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. I want to encourage the students as well. Um, all of these folks are on LinkedIn. Um, so certainly part of what we hope that our students do in attending something like this is taking the next step and connecting with you all um, to just help continue to build their networks of, of folks that they're connected to. Um, and so I hope I hope you see some outreaches in your, your LinkedIn boxes um, in the next few days. Great. Well, thank you students for joining us and I hope everybody has a great night. Take care. Thanks.